Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, The Intersection of Nutrition, Microbiome, and Medical Cannabis, presented by Dr. Deborah Kimless, Medical Director of Forward Grow. My name is Xavier Gutierrez, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Now, before we begin, I would, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email following the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kimless. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Thank you and thank you to everyone at LabRoots for providing this platform so that I can discuss my favorite topic the intersection of nutrition, the microbiome, and medical cannabis. So before I start, um, I am the medical director of Forward Grow, a cultivation and processing company in Maryland, and I'm consulting for Pure Green Canna, a processing and formulation company in Michigan, and I have no actual or potential conflict of interest in relation to this presentation. So Hippocrisy wrote, before you heal someone, Ask him if he's willing to give up the things that make him sick. And this quote resonates with me. And as you will see, I needed to figure out what would be the disruptor, the thing that people could do to help themselves prevent and heal disease. Currently, our healthcare system is such that patients passively give medicine that is given to them, but yet they do nothing to prevent or even help heal illness. So it started out as a thought experiment. And it started out like this. What if, prior to beginning any medical treatment, even cannabis medicine, what if we changed our internal milieu? What if we could create an internal environment that can actually be receptive to healing? And what if that process of changing the body's internal environment is really not that difficult? And all we have to do is change the foods we eat. Food is known to create or destroy our health. Chronic diseases are directly linked to poor eating habits. And I don't think that's much of a surprise. But the question is, what does that mean? How do we implement this? There's so much information and misinformation in the media that talks about what we should and should not eat. So let me be clear. I'm talking about a whole food, all plant diet, and no processed food. I'm intentionally not using the V word, vegan, because Coca-Cola, Oreo cookies, and my daughter says even some Pop-Tarts are vegan. I'm talking about real food found in nature, no animal products, including no sugar, no dairy, no fish, no chicken, nothing with a face, nothing that bleeds when you cut it, and nothing that comes from a mother, and no processed foods, including no added oils. So if you implement this, what will that do? By changing your diet, eating only plants, our body's internal environment actually transforms. And this transformation makes the body more receptive to healing. So why am I talking about food at a cannabis conference? Because I want everyone to understand the why and the how I treat patients. And the patients that I treat are predominantly cancer patients, which is interesting because I'm an anesthesiologist and pain medicine doctor. And so I feel that if you're a cancer patient and you're coming to me for help, we need to do something incredibly different to help maximize the options to help you maintain and gain your best life. In addition to a diet change, I also use medical cannabis for some patients. 
But the medical cannabis I use is something called a microdose of cannabis oil extract. And so I'm now going to show you how I do it. So in medical school, we were taught that our immune system functions a lot better in an alkaline environment than in an acid one. I thought that was a pretty big statement and it was followed up by nothing. No one gave us any tips or tricks as to what that means. And so this big statement, like a lot of other things I've learned in medical school, was just that, a statement, that there was no guidance. So the question is, how do we change our pH? So in the operating room, as an anesthesiologist, I work there. And if somebody's blood gas test comes back with a low pH, there are a lot of different maneuvers that we could use to change the pH. However, life is not an operating room, and those tricks are just that, and it's a temporary fix. And the purpose of changing the pH is to prevent and or help treat chronic disease. So that's why I mandate a whole food, all plant diet. However, I needed proof, one, proving to myself that this made sense, and two, in order to help patients understand this so that they, are, they get on board, um, I have to prove it to them as well. So I started looking into the literature. And so in the Journal of Environmental Public Health in 2012, they published a survey of literature to see what impact, if anything, was the effect of an alkaline diet on a bunch of different uh, health benchmarks. So the survey examined an alkaline diet and back pain, growth hormone, muscle, bone disease, the role of pH on various cells, organs, and membranes. And what they found was that increased fruits and vegetables in an alkaline diet may actually benefit bone health. It could reduce muscle wasting as well as mitigate other chronic illnesses such as high blood pressure and stroke. Result in increase in growth hormone, an alkaline diet or an elevation of their pH would improve outcomes from cardiovascular health to memory and cognition. And the alkalinity may result in an added benefit for some chemotherapy agents and patients who get those types of things for cancer that require a higher pH. But I find it interesting that the conclusion of this survey, after all of these health promoting effects, was this. It would be prudent to consider an alkaline diet to reduce morbidity and mortality of chronic disease. I'm imagining that if there was a pharmaceutical drug that did any one of these things, I think that the language used by the drug company would be a lot different. In 2001, in the Journal of Leukocyte Biology, it also examined what happens to the immune system and immune cells in an acid pH versus an alkaline pH. And the upshot of this study was that the immune system actually works better in an alkaline pH. So how do we implement this change? I can't just leave this as a statement like I learned in medical school and not help to figure out what we can do. So it ends up the most effective method to change your internal milieu from an acid pH to an alkaline pH is to by eating a whole food, all plant diet with no animal products, no processed or prepackaged foods, and no added oils. And so I have my patients test their morning urine every morning on a urine pH test strip to make sure that they're alkaline because you, they will see the importance of, even if they slip for a day, the pH actually does um, alter accordingly. And also we're all in N of one, not everybody's the same. So some people handle things differently, even if it falls under the category of an all plant diet. And so it's a good monitor to, 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 to um, gauge whether or not they're eating properly for themselves. So whole food versus vegan. I have to also prove that because vegan has a, a lot of popularity and we need to discuss the differences. 
And so there continues to be a big disconnect regarding the information between what veganism is, what proper food is, what the right diet is. And so I found this article in a magazine called The Week in March of 2018, and it was under the topic of health scare of the week. They published this little blurb linking processed foods to cancer. And they shared a staggering statistic that says that for every 10% increase in the consumption of processed foods, there was an associated 12% increase in cancer risk. So if you take a bag of snack-sized potato chips, believe it or not, it's about 300 calories. If you eat a 2,000 calorie diet, there's your first bump of a 12% increase in cancer risk. And considering most Americans eat predominantly processed foods as their daily food consumption, this statistic should have been sending out warnings to every media channel, every healthcare provider, every hospital, every school lunch program. But no, I haven't seen or heard anything more than this article in a blurb in a non-medical journal. So here's another interesting study. In 2005, this reported a study done by Dean Ornish, and this was reported in the Journal of uh, Urology. Basically, what they did was take a group of young, healthy men who ate a standard American diet. They took their blood, and on a Petri dish, they had plated out androgen-dependent cancer cells. And they dripped these healthy men's blood on these cancer cells, and they saw that they suppressed cancer growth by 9% because these were otherwise young, healthy men and their immune system functioned somewhat. So then what they did was they changed this group uh, of men's diets to a whole food, all plant diet, no processed foods, no added oils. And they did this for a year. They came back, repeated the study, took their blood, petri dish, plated out some cancer, the prostate cancer cells, dripped it on and found a 70% reduction in prostate cancer cell growth. This was without chemotherapy. This was without any special anything other than a diet change. So then they repeated this study. This time they used women and they used three different breast cancer cell types. So they took women on a standard American diet. They were otherwise healthy. They plated out three different breast cancer cell types on a Petri dish. They dripped the blood, and the um, dark column showed that there was a reduction, a slight reduction in breast cancer cell growth in these women. They put these women on a whole food, all plant diet, no processed foods, no added oil, for only two weeks and repeated this study. And these results are incredible. If you look at the hatch, hatched, marked columns, it shows that, th that there was a statistically significant reduction in tumor growth in all three cancer lines. So slowing cancer growth is great, but what would be better would be killing cancer cells. So again, they took these same women, they were otherwise healthy, they had a standard American diet, um, three separate cancer cell lines, put it in a Petri dish. The dark columns showed a, um, a reduction in cancer development slightly. Two weeks later, same women after a whole food, all plant diet, the hatch marks, the hatch marks column shows a statistically significant increase in breast cancer cell death in all three lines, and that occurred in only two weeks of diet change. Now, if this isn't compelling enough to change people's diets, I don't know what is. So what about oil? Why am I talking about oil? Oil is a whole food, right? And oil can come from vegetables, right? Olive oil and soybean oil and, and such. So there are cells in our body that line our blood vessels, 
and they are, they are called the endothelium. So we originally believed, we meaning the medical and scientific community, originally believed that the endothelium was a vascular lining that really had no other bodily function. However, in the 1980s, scientists learned that the endothelium actually played a very active and important role in our biologic functions. In fact, one of the roles is that the, that the endothelium is one of our largest endocrine glands. It secretes a chemical called nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a potent dilator of blood vessels and regulates blood pressure. So high blood pressure will occur without a functioning endothelial layer, and nitric oxide secretion um, is integral in this. And so how does oil play a role in this? Oil actually destroys that beautiful carpet of those endothelial cells that line our blood vessels. That oil can come from any source, including vegetables. And so there was a study that looked at oil coming from soybeans, palm oils, and olive oil. And they all created a similar acute detrimental effect on the endothelial function in healthy people. Imagine what it does in sick people. So what if you eat a lot of fruit and vegetables and you're saying, well, what if I only have a little bit of meat and a little bit of dairy? How does that work on my endothelium? And sadly, even if it's plant-derived, and even if it's a small amount of animal, it worsens endothelial function. And if you walk into a room where nobody is genetically related, and you raise a, ask somebody over the age of 40 who has high blood pressure, the majority of people will raise their hands. And the reason why is not that we're genetically related. The reason why is because we all eat a similar type diet. Okay, so how does the microbiome fit into this? So there are microorganisms living on within us. In fact, there are more microorganisms on us and within us than there are us. And again, science and medical community originally thought that we all live together, but separately, and that each of us did not act interact with each other. But now we know that is very wrong and that the microbiome is, in, integ is integrated into our biologic processes. And so our diet and food affect us. Our diet and food infect them. We can affect the microbiome and the microbiome can affect us. So what does this mean? So remember that old adage, you are what you eat? We know that that's true. But what also is true is they are what we eat. So when we eat a diet that's whole food, all plants, no processed food, no animals or animal derivatives, and no added oil, we actually cultivate a microbiome that create substances called short-chain fatty acids. These short-chain fatty acids help to maintain the integrity of the intestinal cell junctions that help prevent toxins from getting into our system. This is otherwise called a leaky gut. And that leaky gut can cause inflammation and an intact cell line, junction will prevent that inflammation from happening. And these short-chain fatty acids in and of themselves are highly anti-inflammatory. So when we eat a standard American diet, animals, processed food, junk food, oil, and foods that we think are good, but not, like lean meats, no skin on white meat chicken, or uh, wild caught fish, we end up cultivating a microbiome that secretes chemicals that distort the intestinal cell junctions. This leads to a systemic or our total body exposure to toxins and inflammation. 
and the microbiome that gets created by eating those types of foods also secrete chemicals that are pro-inflammatory, which leads to chronic illness. So the interesting thing is that we're not victims here. We actually have the power to alter the composition of our microbiome and therefore help our own intestinal health and systemic health. And so I found an article in July of 2017 from Injama, and it was titled, Starch-Based Superfood May Protect Against a Variety of Diseases. And this article actually supports the positive aspects of short-chain fatty acids. Yet the conclusion is a little bit different than what I concluded. The conclusion in the JAMA article was, we will now have to wait for pharma to develop a short-chain fatty acid pill. I don't think so. So research has shown that the microbiome can influence positively or negatively all of these medical conditions, from diabetes to cancer, to liver disease, to autoimmune issues, chronic heart issues and kidney problems, insomnia, obesity, and autism, and HIV AIDS. So by altering your microbiome, you can influence positively or negatively all of these things. And so what we put in our mouths actually matters. So I guess the question is, why are we discussing a whole plant nutrition when everybody was expecting a cannabis talk? And the reason is, when I was studying about the microbiome, it dawned on me that it looks, that the biologic influences look surprisingly like the constellation of diseases and conditions for which medical cannabis is often recommended. So this is why I mandated diet change. Patients are desperate to heal and they have literally exhausted all traditional medical options. And they're sick and dying. And they're coming to see me, who's an anesthesiologist and not an oncologist. Then clearly they have a serious problem. I want to give them the best possible chance. There's no panacea, of course. However, with the above data that I just presented, I think it only makes sense. The truth is that we humans, all of us, whether we're sick or not, to be eating this way to prevent chronic illness. And hopefully someday this information will resonate with the healthcare community and actually resonate with the general population as well. So now on to the cannabis part. So cannabis interacts with a biologic system that all of us have. In fact, almost every living thing has it. And it's called the endocannabinoid system. Endo means endogenous or within. And cannabinoid means that our own body makes chemicals that are similar to the chemicals that the cannabis plant makes, just like our body makes chemicals called endorphins, similar to what the poppy plant makes, right, opium. And so the purpose of our endocannabinoid system is to maintain homeostasis or a physiologic balance. So what does that mean? It means that our own endocannabinoid system is involved in every single biologic system in our bodies from thinking to pooping and everywhere in between. So why then don't we know about this endocannabinoid system? It's not taught in biology class. I certainly didn't learn it in medical school or residency or any of the tens of thousands of dollars and hours that, of CME credits that I had to take to maintain my medical license. Besides the fact that cannabis been stigmatized. The elements of the endocannabinoid system were only recently discovered in the late 1980s and the late 1990s, and we're still learning more and more. And the reason is different from an organ-based system where you can actually open up somebody and see a heart or a lung or a liver, and different from an, uh, a cellular-based system where you can look at slides under a microscope. The endocannabinoid system is a chemical-based system. It took a long time uh, before they were able to identify it and describe it. 
Briefly, the endocannabinoid system is made up of endocannabinoids, which are our endogenous um, chemicals that we make. And the two most notables are AEA or anandamide and QAG receptors, which these uh, endocannabinoids interact with. And the most uh, uh, discussed is CB1 and CB2, but there are lots of other receptors that they interact with is, and they're still identifying more and the enzymes that make the endocannabinoids and break them down. And the interesting thing about the endocannabinoids is that they're made on demand, they're used locally, and they're rapidly broken down, and they're not stored. And that'll play an important um, role in the next conversation. Phytocannabinoids, that's just a fancy word for the plant's chemicals, interact with our body's endocannabinoid receptors. So briefly, the cannabis plant is literally a chemical manufacturing factory. It makes over 400 chemicals, 100 of which are specific to the plant, known as phytocannabinoids. There's over 100 terpenes. These are the chemicals that give the scent and taste to the cannabis plant. Flavonoids, which provides color and are, are antioxidants and anti-inflammatory. And the Interesting thing is intoxication, that you know, high that everybody ascribes to the cannabis is caused by only a few of those over a hundred plus cannabinoids. And of the non-intoxicating cannabinoids, they have tremendous bioactivity. And the interesting thing about that is that many people just think about cannabis as being THC, but really it's all of the cannabinoids and terpenes and flavonoids that work together, called the entourage effect or synergistic effect, and that works better than Marinol. And for those of you that don't know what Marinol is, it's a synthetic THC. Since the 1980s, we as physicians were allowed to prescribe it to any patient. They can be prescribed this across 50 states without uh, worrying about any federal illegality. You can take it on trips with you. Why then does it, is it not used? Because without the whole plant benefit, Marinol just doesn't work as well. So now coming full circle, endocannabinoids, cannabis, in the microbiome. It seems that the role of the endocannabinoid system is directly involved in that brain-gut axis. So the gut talks to the brain through, and through the microbiome and through um, our enteric nervous system, and the endocannabinoid system is integrally involved. There are studies that show that endocannabinoids are at the crossroad between the gut microbiota and our metabolism. Cannabinoid signaling regulates inflammation and energy balance, the importance of the, green, the brain gut access. And so it seems that it's been known for some time that the brain can modulate the gut. That's like gut feeling. With endocannabinoids, it appears that the gut can also modify the brain. The whole thing is interconnected which is why we're having this conversation. Last but not least, I wanna talk about microdosing because this is how I begin my patients using medical cannabis if needed. So the term microdose is a term of art. It doesn't mean 10 to the minus six. It really is a technique for studying behavior of drugs in humans where um, the doses are so low, they're unlikely to produce a whole body effect and high enough to allow for a cellular response. The reason why uh, this is so important is that people often vilify THC for its intoxicating effects. But small amounts of THC can be hugely beneficial in patients, and it depends on the amount of THC one uses that will determine whether there's intoxication. In small amounts, most patients don't feel it. So interesting, phytocannabinoids are different than our endocannabinoids. So the chemicals from the plant, if taken, it is generally taken internally through different methods of consumption. It confers systemic effects. 
It's stored in fat because these chemicals are highly fat soluble. And because it's stored in fat, it acts as a depot for a slow release. And just to remind you, the endocannabinoids, the chemicals our own body makes, is made on demand, is used locally, rapidly broken down and not stored. And so my thought was, if that's the case, if phytocannabinoids or the you know, chemicals from the plant are held in our body for a period of time, why would we need a lot of them? And so this was my idea of what constitutes a low dose or a microdose. So if a, a general dose is if you have a, a joint, which is a gram, which is a thousand milligrams, and I promise this is the only math we'll, we'll do today, and 20% of that cannabis plant is THC. There will be 200 milligrams of THC. If you were to smoke that joint, 30 to 40% is lost to side stream smoke and ash. You only get about 60 to 80 milligrams. And when I'm talking about a microdose, I'm talking about less than two milligrams of total cannabinoid, the THC, CBD, and any of the other minor cannabinoids as well. And of course, I had to go to... Um, the literature to support my hypothesis. And so Legresti et al. in 2006 did a very similar study um, as the, the vegan study that I described using a Petri dish cancer, cancer cell lines that they grew out. And instead of um, putting people's blood on it, they put different cannabinoids and then different fractions of THC rich and the CBD rich solutions to see what would slow down cancer growth. And this is a very busy slide that reports it in micromoles. And when you do uh, the conversion from micromoles to um, milligrams using Avogadro's equation, you will see that the microdose actually makes sense. So now I'm going to discuss some patients as examples of um, how I treat them and some of the successes. So these are two prostate cancer patients. The first one is a 72-year-old man that had a recurrent prostate cancer diagnosis. He was diagnosed in 2011. In 2015, his PSA started to rise. In uh, 2016, his PSA level went to 7.8, and sadly, his biopsy um, revealed recurrent cancer. And fortunately, his CAT scan showed uh, no metastasis. He began his first of three Lupron injections, and the problem was he didn't respond. After the first one, after a month, his PSA uh, remained at 7.8, and he was concerned that he was not going to be able to be treated effectively. So we started him on uh, his diet, low-dose cannabis oil, continued the second and third Lupron injection because I never uh, changed the traditional therapy if possible. So this slide shows in blue his first month of the Lupron injection. Second month shows blue, his second Lupron injection, and the red is uh, when we introduced his diet change and his low-dose cannabis oil. So again, the low-dose cannabis oil was less than two milligrams uh, per ml of total cannabinoid. It was a sublingual oil that goes under the tongue, and he used one, um, one milliliter four times a day. And after the second month, his PSA was almost cut in half. He continued for his third month. His PSA dropped to 0.3. His fourth month, he no longer was on Lupron. It maintained a 0.3. The fifth month, this is 2015. This is 2019 now. And his PSA remains at 0.1. This is a 81-year-old, otherwise healthy man who had a one-year history of metastatic prostate cancer. Sadly, he, uh, was he was treated with seed implants, radiation, and Lupron injections, and sadly, it was uh, refractory to that. He continued to have escalating testosterone levels. He was ready to have surgery to remove his testosterone-generating organ, which was his testicles. Um, Clearly, he didn't want that surgery, so he came to me, and we started him on low-dose cannabis oil. This time, we treated him five times a day and changed his diet. And so his testosterone level started at a high level of 1,350 nanograms per deciliter. 
and only in two weeks after a diet change and cannabinoids, it was cut in half. He went to a surgeon and said, what do you think? I dropped by uh, almost half and the surgeon thought it was incredible. He said, but it's still too high and we still need to do surgery. And the patient asked for two more weeks and it dropped in two more weeks. His testosterone level dropped lower than what they would have expected from his, um, if he had surgery. There are a lot of studies that show cannabinoids and prostate cancer and how it can uh, help. Brain cancer, two patients. So the first case is a 69-year-old man who woke up in the emergency room after having a surgery. An MRI re revealed that he had a tumor. A biopsy diagnosed him with a glioblastoma. He was discharged from the hospital. He was incredibly lethargic. He was in unable to perform his activities of daily living without assistance and the tremendous cognitive changes. The only medicine they put him on was Tegretol for seizures. And this is his MRI um, when he was diagnosed in the, in the uh, hospital. And that white mass shows um, a, a large glioblastoma in an area of the brain that was not amenable to surgery. And when they did a biopsy and tested for the chemotherapy, it was resistant to the chemotherapy they usually do. So his only uh, ability was to have radiation therapy. He changed his diet, started him on low dose cannabis oil four times a, a day. And somehow somebody ordered an MRI only two weeks later. And this is his, his post two weeks. And the radiology report reads central cystic Degeneration clearly responding to radiation therapy continue. Unfortunately, or fortunately, he didn't see the radiation oncologist. That was scheduled for two more weeks. Um, so this is what it was pre and post. And this was nine months later. And again, there are a lot of studies looking at the different cannabinoids cannabis as a whole in regard to treatment of cancers. Next patient, and this is the one that always uh, just chills down my spine and, and a lump in my throat. This is a story of an eight-year-old girl with acute lymphocytic leukemia. She failed multiple chemotherapy and radiation trials. She failed bone marrow transplant and was in hospice. The chief complaints from the parents regarding her was chronic nausea, lack of appetite, headache, and lack of energy. She was lethargic upon uh, evaluation and not really communicative. She looked swollen. And the only medicines that she had was methadone and morphine in divided doses. And her MRI um, in hospice or prior to going into hospice was this, and white is either bone or bad. The bone on the outside is her skull. And the, I mean, the white on the outside is her skull. The white parts on the um, where the brain is shows the leptomeningeal spread of her, um, of her cancer. And so the goals are to prove the quality of life before she died, to try to get, get a handle of her pain, to try to transition her off opiates to um, help her enjoy her, her, her last days. So we start her on oil, sublingual four times a day, and we um, change her diet. So the response was interesting. Initially, we were able to reduce and replace uh, all of the opiates. She became more active. And she started to uh, show appropriate demeanor, which means that she was talking back to her mother, um, refusing to take a shower, or a bath, and I believe eye rolling was involved. Mother said this was not the response of the reaction of a, of a dying child and demanded another MRI. And the MRI revealed a mass dis uh, reduction of cancer in her brain. And this is the before and after. This was in 2015. And so we transitioned her from um, hospice to second grade and she's now in in the fourth grade or whatever. Anyway, lots of studies that show how cannabis works with cancer.
and leukemia. Lung cancer. This is a story of a 58-year-old female smoker and in 2016 diagnosed with a metastatic adenocarcinoma of the lung. He had a left lower uh, lung removal and they were, putting her, they were going to put her on chemo and radiation. She was given less than a 10% five-year survival. She changed her diet, started microdose cannabis oil. An interesting thing, because not every success is about, about living or dying. It's about quality of life as well. She was able to endure traditional therapy, her chemotherapy. She was able to maintain weight by eating. She had no nausea and vomiting. She was able to go to work every day, do her activities of daily living, socialize throughout her entire chemo and radiation treatment. Interestingly enough, she's still alive and well. And again, there are lots of studies that show the importance of um, cannabis in regard to the treatment of, of a lot of symptomatic effects of traditional therapeutic treatments as well as with cancer itself. And so I hope this was a compelling discussion, understanding the importance of having a proper internal environment, using food as medicine to help heal and prevent disease, and if needed, medical cannabis, even in the proper amounts, seems to make a lot of sense. I wanna thank you for listening and giving me this opportunity to share my passion with you. Well, thank you, Dr. Kimless, for that informative presentation. I would also like to thank Labroots for making today's educational webcast possible. And before we go, I want to let everyone know that this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through June of 2019. And as a final reminder, our speaker will follow up with any questions you've submitted via email. That's all for now. Thank you for joining, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.